I was born in the eastern part of Czechoslovakia. It's a nice sized town. My family consists of my father, Herman, who owns a hardware houseware store. My mother, Berta, who is a typical Jewish mother, takes care of the children in the house. Two older sisters, my sister, Lily, and my sister, Olga. As a child, I was sort of forced into playing piano, but I much rather played soccer. Uh, life was really good. I was uh, bar mitzvah at the age of 13, which is a uh, becoming of age ceremony in uh, Jewish religion. Uh, just, you know, a, a big shindig. 1939, two things happened that uh, came up uh, later on in my life that had such an impact. First of all, uh, Hitler invaded Poland and the slaughter of the Jews have started. Of course, we didn't know about this yet. Uh, and our town and the little section, eastern section of Czechoslovakia was given to Hungary. And the reason for this was the Hungarians were fighting on the side of the Germans and this was sort of a little gift. Used to be the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire. A native language is Hungarian. And uh, as the early 40s rolled around, there was more and more anti-Semitism, uh, which was very scary. And we had an assembly in our school, an assembly when all the students had to attend. And uh, the keynote speaker was a man from the uh, Nilash party, which was the Hungarian Nazi party. And he was just ranting and raving about how terrible the Jews are, how Everything is the fault of the Jews, the war, the shortages in food, etc., etc. And I was looking at my friends sitting next to me from the Jewish friends from uh, the uh, team that we played soccer together. And I was asking them, what have we done to deserve this? You know, this is so horrible. Anyhow, it was very scary. And as time went by, you know, it was getting worse and worse. And... Uh, then it got to the point that my father was told to close his store, inventory it, and close it. Then the order came from the Hungarian authorities that all the Jewish students will have to stop going to school. Didn't understand why this was interrupting my education. And it was just really horrible. And then the coup de grace came, which was Everybody had to wear the yellow star to denote that you are a Jew, which was really, really depressing because you were open to both verbal and physical abuse. And of course, then the order came that all the Jews will be uh, transported. This was the rumors anyway. Uh, the Jewish families, on a specific date, you had to gather up your belongings, whatever you could carry, which included clothing and some food and some blankets. And you had to stand in front of your house where Hungarian soldiers came. And they have a list of all the Jewish families and they knew exactly how many members of your family was supposed to be there. And then we were marched out to the center of town to be collected with other parts of the city, the Jewish population. And we were marched out to the outside of town where this huge brick factory was located. And we stayed in little buildings. Fortunately for us, there are good Christian neighbors who were able to come and hand some food through the barbed wire to us, otherwise we wouldn't have any food to eat. So here we are in the brick factory, guarded by Hungarian soldiers. And one morning for the first time in the brick factory, we see SS officers and enlisted men, which is extremely scary. Uh, we are told that uh, the families will be kept together. We are going to, going to work on farms together. We're going to be in factories. And an SS officer starts counting off people. They get to my father, Herman, number 77, my mother, Berta, number 78, Sister Lily, son, number 70, 79, my sister Olga, 80. 80 human beings into the cattle car. The cattle car is a huge rust color 
wagon with sliding doors, very small windows which had barbed wire on it. And I'm number one in the next car. So here I'm finally separated also from my family. Uh, after the train is all filled up, the train starts going. We are in terrible, terrible shock. Uh, I don't think that I have ever been so scared in my life now that I'm by myself. After three days and three nights, we arrive to this destination. The sliding doors are open, and we see SS guards with attack dogs yelling Ali Haraus, which means everybody out. This, of course, is Auschwitz. We have not heard about Auschwitz. I jump off the car. I meet up with my family again. Everybody's in total shock. We have absolutely no idea what's going to happen to us. Hardly have time to say goodbye to my mother and two sisters because they're separating the women from the men. And we are lined up five in a row and start marching toward this line of SS officers who are basically playing God. They're pointing to my father, you go this way, pointing to me, you go this way. Absolutely no idea why this is happening. I don't even see my mother and two sisters anymore because they are on the women's side. And we are, those who went to the right, are going to this huge open field. There are no, no little boys there anymore. There are no elderly men, no middle-aged men either. They're mostly from mid-teens up to about 40. Here we are standing in this open field. The order comes that uh, take off all our clothing and our shoes. In quick succession, we had to run to our first station when our, our bodily hair was shaved off. Next station, everything was in double time. Uh, they s sprayed you with some disinfectant. Then you went into the huge barracks with showers. This is the first time that you actually, there's no soap, no towels, that you were able to drink water that was coming out from the showers. And wet and na naked, you were running into this big uh, barracks where piles of clothing that you just saw a little while ago on the young men, the prisoners, there was a pile of jackets, blue and white striped jackets, then a pile of pants. There was some uh, rope and wire to hold up your pants, a pair of wooden shoes, a little blue and white cap, one dish, one cup, and a spoon. And this was your worldly belongings now. And then it's just you start talking to prisoners who have been in Auschwitz, who happen to be in the same barracks with you, who have been there a lot longer than you, the Hungarian arrivals are, and you start asking questions. And my question was to one of them, how come that my father went to one side and I went to the other side? And he says, come with me. And he takes me outside the barracks and he points in the distance. There is a huge chimney. It's belching smoke and sparks and uh, just terrible stench. And he says, your father is going up the chimney. And I don't understand what he's talking about. It's just shocking that people are actually doing this. And I'm in Auschwitz just a few weeks, and I'm pulled out from one of these selections. And I am put on the same kind of uh, cattle car train. As soon as we get off the train, we are told to line up, we're going to get some food. They give us a little bit bigger piece of bread and in Auschwitz. The soup that we got was not as watery as in Auschwitz. I actually had a couple pieces of vegetables in it. Get a piece of fish. We thought, we were really, this is really great. Of course, this is just another slave labor camp where uh, they're going to try to kill you through labor. Uh, my first job was to go out to the train station where we arrived, and there's this huge pile of uh, steel rails that the, rail, r the trains run on, you know. And they are pretty long, and they assign three prisoners to each of the rails. You pick it up, put it on your shoulder, and you start marching up this hill, let's say about a football field length. 
and you put it down, and then other prisoners pick it up and take it the rest of the way. And you go back and pick up another one, so you actually turn into a robot, which you do all day from sun up to sundown. Go from pick one up, put it down, pick one up, put it down. This thing is extremely heavy, so you switch it over to the other uh, shoulder, then you switch it back, and before you know it, your shoulders are just totally, totally painful. They start bleeding. People are falling under the weight of uh, the, the uh, steel rails. It's, you know, it, it, what goes through your mind is that what's going to happen here? You know, what's going to happen to me? Uh, why, why am I doing this thing? Why am I surrounding by, surrounded by people who are beating you because you're not walking fast enough? Or SS guards that will just at a whim would hit you with a rifle butt. And you just are in shock. You don't know what's happening. It's extremely scary. You don't know how long you can last. And the terrible thing that happens is that you start seeing prisoners die. And this is terrible because I'm looking at the dead body and I'm thinking, this is somebody's father, somebody's son, somebody's husband. How terrible this is that this person will never, never make it home. And then there is something in you that sort of clicks in after a while, which is self-preservation. How, how am I going to stay alive? And Something happens that you have to get yourself a goal in your head, in your brain. You got to decide on something. So in my case, I decided on two things. Number one, I know my father is dead. I don't know what's happening to my mother and two sisters. What happens if my mother and two sisters survive and I die in the camps? How terrible it would be for them to come home and missing the father and the only son of the family. This gave me an incentive to keep going. The number two thing was, I told myself, if they kill me, they win. If I stay alive, I win. This was like on a daily basis. My chore. Every night when I went to sleep, I told myself, I'm going to wake up in the morning. Every morning I told myself, I'm going to see this day through. I befriend a young prisoner, and I sort of have a buddy system. We try to uh, line up uh, when we go out to work to different work sites. And then an interesting thing happens. One morning when we are lined up, again, the young prisoner is in the front. Uh, the SS sergeant that stands about three meters from me says, who amongst you young prisoners speaks German? I put my hand up. He says, come with me. He takes me to the gate of the camp. Here is a man in civilian uniform. And I take my head off, and I, I'm prisoner so-and-so. I rattle off my number. And he says to me, I am Mr. So-and-so. I am a civilian engineer attached to this camp. My job is to survey for the next two weeks, survey where the railroad and the other roads will be going, and I need somebody to help me with my equipment. You are going to take the wooden board with the numbers on it, and I have the tripod with the, my instrument. I'm going to tell you, stand here, face the board in my direction, and I will go way, way, way down. He scribbles his findings in, from his instrument, and then he beckons me to go there and stand there, and then this goes on. Next morning, the first thing he says to me, I see what terrible, terrible condition you people are in, and my head, my brain just doesn't want to connect. Why should this German even think that we are in terrible conditions? Why should he say this to me? And then the next thing he says, I tell you what we're going to do. Every day for the next two weeks, when 
we are going back to the big work site where you have to uh, attach yourself to the work party that you marched out with. Uh, I will point to a barracks in the woods. This is where the SS and the civilian uh, German engineers are having their lunch. This is going to be way past lunchtime, so you don't have to worry that anybody will be in there. When I point, you go in there, go to the far corner, look under the bench. There's a piece of meat, piece of real bread, maybe some cheese or something. There's a little cup of milk, which I drink because there's no way I can put it. I put it in my pocket. I uh, come out and thank him. This is a real human being. I credit this man with saving my life. This went on for two weeks. And due to the fact that I got this extra nourishment, and I was really, really, you know, rationing myself, and I also shared some of the stuff with a new friend. And I was able to rebuild my system to the point that I was able to continue.